Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Digital British Library event. My name is Cara Rodway, and I'm the deputy head of the Eccles Centre for American Studies here at the British Library. The Eccles Centre exists to support and promote creative research and lifelong learning about the Americas through the world-class collections of the British Library. We do this through a varied programme which includes providing fellowships and awards and supporting public events like this. If you'd like to find out more about the centre's work, you can visit our website. We can find details of our social media, our profiles and our mailing list, which I would urge you to join. I'm very excited to be kicking off our fascinating event about, about Frank Pruitt uh, today and would like to offer my thanks to our British Library colleagues in the events team for producing the event with us and to the Canadian High Commission for their help and support bringing the event together. Some quick uh, housekeeping notes. If you'd like to submit any questions to our speakers, uh, you can do so at any point during the event by posting them in the form immediately below the video window. Uh, if you're interested uh, and inspired by this talk to buy uh, Joy Porter's book on Frank Pruitt, please visit the tab marked books at the top of the screen um, and you can get a 35% discount by entering the code uh, PREW21 when ordering. And other tabs that you'll see at the top will enable you to give your feedback on the event uh, or to make a donation to support the work of the British Library. So finally, I'm delighted to introduce our event chair, Erica Wagner. Erica is an author of fiction and nonfiction, including Chief Engineer, her account of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, which she wrote whilst an Eccles Centre Writers Award winner. A former literary editor of the Times, she's been a man booker judge and is a regular reviewer for the New York Times. It's a pleasure to have her with us as always, uh, and I'm now going to pass over to Erica to introduce our speaker and reader. I hope you'll have a lovely uh, event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cara. Uh, and it's just wonderful to be back digitally with my friends at the British Library. Sometimes true stories seem made for fiction. The story of Frank Pruitt is such a one, and we're privileged and thrilled to be able to discover it here at the Eccles Center for American Studies. Professor Joy Porter, joining us this evening, is the author of Trauma, Primitivism, and the First World War, The Making of Frank Toronto Pruitt, which explores the extraordinary life of this Canadian veteran, poet, and exceptional man of letters, and the history of trauma, literary expression, and the power of self-representation after the First World War. While fighting for the British in that conflict, Pruitt was severely injured. Recovering at the same psychiatric hospital as Siegfried Sassoon, he was encouraged to dress up. And so he took on an entirely fictitious identity as an indigenous Canadian named Toronto. His good looks and his talent brought him into the Bloomsbury set. Both Sassoon and Lady Ottiline Morel were fascinated by him and by his so-called primitive genius. Even after the revelation that he had no native heritage, Pruitt himself never let go of his fabricated indigenous identity. There are so many topics to discuss here. The damage inflicted by trauma, the draw of other, perhaps supposedly purer identities, the complicated truths of art and culture. Professor Porter will be our guide. She is a writer, researcher, and academic from the north of Ireland who writes about indigenous and environmental history, modernity, and war. She is a Leverhulme major research fellow and principal investigator of the Treated Spaces Research Cluster based at the University of Hull. She recently launched Brightening the Covenant Chain, a research project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Her next book is Canada's Green Challenge, contracted with McGill Queen's University Press. We are also delighted to have with us tonight, Alexander McMurrin, a Canadian actor and musician, originally from Vancouver, but now based in London. Since graduating from Lambda, his theatrical highlights include playing Joey the Lips in the first UK and Ireland tour of Roddy Doyle's The Commitments, and his West End debut in the UK premiere of Stephen Dietz's Lonely Planet. Alex has proudly been the lone Canadian cast member in the wonderful show, Come From Away, since it opened in the West End in 2019, and which is hopefully having its long awaited reopening this summer. Alexander will be reading 
some of Pruitt's poetry to us. And once again, um, marvelous audience, before I hand over to Joy and her presentation, I do urge you, if you have any questions, um, to post them as they occur to you. And I will then come to them as Joy and I chat after her presentation. Joy, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, I must say, Frank Pruitt would have loved that all these talented people have come together to tell his story. He'd have just loved this. I think it would have been, uh, if, if he's up there, he's looking down. And he is someone whose ideas and poetry is quite haunting. So I wouldn't kind of put, I wouldn't put it past him. So there's so much that's so interesting about Frank Pruitt. I thought, well, why, why would you be interested? I know why I spent about 10 years uh, researching him. And I boiled it down to about six different themes. And the, there they are on this um, screen share. It's about six main reasons, but there's a series of other reasons you might find him interesting. Because he touches upon so much that's so important I took an interdisciplinary approach to telling his story. And I just told the story around the time of the First World War and the ensuing pandemic and then the 20s. So uh, I, I, I put a, a deliberate lens on that, that period. And I'm so grateful that the Eccles Center and the British Library and uh, Alex uh, McMoran, all these people, uh, and, and Erica are so uh, kind as to highlight his story. Um, I also want to say that I'm really appreciative that some really quite important people apparently are tuning in, including Miranda Seymour, who really her work commands the whole Bloomsbury field. And I'm very grateful that, that she's uh, apparently out there tonight uh, also. So one of the real important reasons Frank Pruitt matters is because he gives us a fascinating access point into the First World War and into shell shock. I'll just flip to the next slide if I can. Uh, this is just something I want to play in the background. Um, people have said this, this slide, uh, this little film from the period, uh, says a lot about the First World War because it was quite often the case that men lived this troglodyte existence where they were either in the soil uh, or dealing with soil in, in the trenches. And Pruitt, he suffers this really serious debilitating psychological combat trauma that we uh, still talk about as shell shock. And it was a result largely of unprecedented technological onslaught that men faced at this time. He grows up, he's Canadian, farm boy, middle class, and he's from a real fire and brimstone Protestant Ontario farming family. And he's born 1893, and he grows up on Haudenosaunee territory or Iroquois territory. And Indigenous kids from the nearby residential schools would make regular escape bids across the Pruitt farm. And Pruitt grew up with a big hero being Tom Longboat. It's one of his earliest heroes, who's a famous Onondaga Haudenosaunee Olympic marathon runner. At the time, one of the fastest men on earth uh, over long distances. Pruitt has a fairly classic um, set of reasons for joining up in 1914. And he is very enthusiastic and has dreams that he's going to help Canada become a real player on the world stage. And uh, remember, Canada had only become a self-governing entity on the 1st of July, 1867. So, you know, 44 years before the start of the war. And um, Pruitt joins up really quite green. He sees a lot of combat. He's in the trenches in France. He's at the Somme. He's at the Second Battle of Yip. He's at Vime, the battle often held up as the coming of age conflict for Canada as a nation on the world stage. And the main point is he sees a lot of death 
and it affects him profoundly. And I'm gonna ask our extremely talented actor, and I'm so grateful that he's here, to now read the first of Pruitt's poems. It's called Card Game. Now, it's written the way that Ernest Hemingway wrote, uh, in, in the sense that just the top 10% of meaning is in the poem. The nine tenths of the bottom of the iceberg of meaning is for you as the uh, reader or hearer to comprehend just why these men are so intent upon their card game. Card game. Hearing the whine and crash, we hastened out and found a few poor men lying about. I put my hand in the breast of the first met. His heart thumped, stopped, and I drew my hand out wet. Another, he seemed a boy, rolled in the mud, screaming, My legs! My legs! And he poured out his blood. We bandaged the rest and went in, and started again at our cards where we had been. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Best to hear a Canadian voice saying the, the poem. So Pruitt, I consider a very significant poet of modern trauma. And it's perhaps only now that we're able to understand his work and his life in that light, given that understanding of the mind and of, of and therapy itself has so significantly advanced in the 20th century. It was two primary events that really had traumatic impact on Pruitt. And I'll just show you this little slide of what shell shock was like, how it materially impacted on the body in this period. These are some men who have, uh, who are being treated. The body felt the suffering and felt the shock of the explosions and of being overwhelmed by fear in a way that didn't leave these men. If you look in this guy's eyes, you can see that full pupil dilation that is abiding fear that doesn't leave. What caused shell shock for Pruitt? First of all, he's thrown from a horse after an explosion in 1916. The second thing that happens, though, is that he's thrown from a horse and he is buried alive. That happened in April 1918. Now, being buried alive psychologically, uh, for Freud at least, was the ultimate uh, mental anguish. It's the ultimate subversion of the repression that allows each of us to function day to day. It's basically a blowing up or an explosion of the archaeology of the mind. And Pruitt ends up terribly shell-shocked. Because when you're buried alive, you uh, strain every sinew, you feel the soil crushing your ribs and your bones, the lungs fill with earth, the eyes bulge out, tongue goes blue, you're, you're, it's, it's an extreme bodily uh, experience. And Pruitt is fundamentally mentally damaged by it, is never the same. He goes into what he calls a blue and gold existence. He became convinced that he was actually dead and that the dead were all around him and that uh, he only he could see and comprehend them. He was interacting with them all in various states of decomposition. This was his waking and sleeping reality, worse when he was asleep. He gets treatment for it. Uh, first at a place uh, called Craig Lockhart, which is fairly uh, well known. He's 24 when he's there. And then he's at Lennell Hospitals. And it's at this point that he takes on this Toronto Indian identity. And here he is wearing the clothes. And you can see his eyes have got that shell shock, permanently terrified look uh, in his face. At the same time, in this fully adopted indigenous persona, he meets Siegfried Sassoon. And uh, Sassoon falls quite abidingly 
for Pruitt. And the two have an ongoing uh, love affair or love interest, intimate friendship that lasts well into the 1920s. I'd like now for Alex to read the next poem of Pruitt's, which is called Kelso Road. I consider, oh, by the way, here is uh, Sassoon uh, with a later lover called Stephen Tennant, who's an amazing figure, uh, but that's another story and probably another book. Anyway, this next poem I'd like Alex to read is called Kelso Road. It's a walking poem where Pruitt, he writes a series of these, uh, where he inscribes the landscape with emotional and traumatic uh, meaning, and he is communing fully with the dead. So over to Alex, please. The Kelso Road. Morning and evening are mine, and the bright noonday. But night to no man doth belong when the sad ghosts play. From Kelso Town I took the road by the full flood tweed. The black clouds swept across the moon with devouring greed. No peace to tread the night. I felt above my head blowing the clouds edge, faces wry in pale fury spread. Twelve surly elves were digging graves beside Black Eden Brook. Twelve dug and stared at me, but one read in a book. In Burgum trees and hedges rocked, the moon was drowned in black. At Hersel Woods I shrieked to find a fiend astride my back. His legs he closed about my breast, his hands upon my head, till cold stream lights beamed in the trees, and he wailed and fled. Morning and evening are mine, and the bright noon heat. But at night the sad, thin ghosts for their revels meet. Thank you so much. By the way, the image you can see uh, is from the Signal House Art House Journal. And um, this is Mary Herbert uh, inspired this painting recently, uh, her exposure to Pruitt's work. Uh, so look on the Signal House edition if you'd like to find out more about that. A third reason that Pruitt's really interesting is because okay. of anthropology. He was treated at Craig Lockhart by the father of British anthropology, uh, W.H.R. Rivers. And Rivers is a fascinating figure who, uh, through the course of treating young men, himself seems to flower. And I think um, he becomes a socialist. He becomes more at ease with himself. Rivers was also homosexual, uh, but not in an overt way at the time. Uh, Rivers meeting Pruitt, we think this happened. And we also think that uh, Rivers was treating um, Sassoon and also treating uh, Robert Graves, the poet, around this time. He was a social evolutionary uh, anthropologist. And the interesting thing about Rivers possibly treating Pruitt, because we have no actual records of it happening, is that it would have been one primitivist thinker coming across another person adopting primitivism for his own uh, reasons. And I discussed this uh, in a chapter just devoted to rivers and reappraising rivers as a figure really who's been uh, given to us through one biography and a series of um, novels and, and subsequent movies. And I think uh, we need to be more aware of the irony of rivers treating Pruitt and also the primitivism that was at the heart of Rivers's approach. This was pers a person, after all, who would go out to the Tory Strait and examine um, Indigenous peoples there to see whether they had better vision as a compensation 
for their supposed lack of innate intelligence. So he had really quite strong primitivist ideas himself. He believed there's one single sav savage mind, et cetera, et cetera. He's someone who really is important to military psychology also. And um, he had this real uh, idea of advanced and inferior um, races as another problematic term and he also thought that what happened in the mind was replicated in terms of the empire and that uh, um, the superior would somehow sometimes have to repress the inferior within the mind as it did in terms of geopolitics and the empire so I think if you're interested in the history of anthropology Pruitt meeting or being in the world of W.H.R. Rivers has its own um, fascination. But the bit about the story that's attracted most attention is when Pruitt partied after the war, post-pandemic, having survived influenza himself after he was repatriated to Canada and before. And he spends his time in uh, 20s Oxford, which is a fascinating place to have been at the time. A kind of intellectual clearinghouse was what it was like. He remains in a Haudenosaunee, probably most of the time Mohawk identity from about 1918 onwards. And he finds himself in really exalted literary circles and he's a social smash hit. I forgot to mention he's extremely good looking smoldering good looks. Everyone thought he looked like Rudolf Valentino. And he plays it up at the stately home called Garsington of Lady Ottiline Morell. And she was talked of as the daughter of a thousand earls. And um, Lady Ottiline Morell falls for Pruitt as so many people did. And here's a sense of just how attractive he is. Here he is in Garsington Manor being brooding and intense and really channeling his primitivist identity. Here's another woman who had a little thing for him, the painter Dorothy Brett, and she paints this beautiful, beautiful picture of his smoldering uh, good looks. And he'd play up to it enormously. I think, you know, if he could be played now, he'd be a, a young Johnny Depp, I think. He would go around topless on a sienna colored horse at Garsington and uh, everyone became convinced that he was going to be the next big literary smash. His poetry is typeset ultimately by Virginia Woolf. First book's called Poems, 1921. Uh, he, Sassoon's still pursuing him, taking him to Rome, various things like that. He's very close with Robert Graves who remains convinced that Pruitt is indigenous uh, all his life. He's also very close to Edmund Blondin. He appears, uh, Pruitt appears in Oxford poetry. Uh, Graves ultimately edited his collection did poems in 1962. And the list of folk that Pruitt ends up corresponding with or knowing is really long. Includes W.B. Yeats, D.H. Lawrence, Aldous Huxley, Lytton Strachey. This, of course, is Lady Ottiline Morell, who knew everyone and probably had a thing with them. Uh, the painters, Mark Gertler, Dorothy Brett, whom I've mentioned, Harold Monroe, T.S. Eliot, Walter de la Mer, E.M. Forster, Ezra Pound, the Sitwells, Catherine Mansfield and her husband, John Middleton Murray. Overall, I call Pruitt a remarkable intellect caught up at an extraordinary time with exceptional people. Virginia Woolf wrote to Lytton Strachey in 1921 in the hot weather and said, the TLS says that Pruitt is a poet, perhaps a great one. And she was very attracted to Garsington rather in the way that one's attracted to a car crash. You just can't keep away. And Garsington, I could talk about at great length, but it was a place where people could behave theatrically, really be very sexually free, uh, at all ends of the spectrum in ways that were socially uh, not acceptable uh, in polite society at the time. There was a lot of skinny dipping by the pool. Garsington's still an extremely beautiful place. And hello, Susan, if you're out there, the current owner. 
And uh, there were, these are some photos of the bottom right of some of the skinny dipping that went on. And of course, Ottoline was notorious as the, the person, I mean, she would have as the Asquiths there. She had everyone there and it was a very libertine space. Here's some of the people who would be there. Uh, there's Strachey, Virginia Woolf. These are all Garsington pictures. They're all the National Portrait Gallery. There's Yeats bloviating as he would do. There's Forster, 1922. There's the same room that Pruitt was in and there's Sassoon. And this is a whole group, including the Sitwells. And I think that's young Julian Garsington's um, Ottoline's daughter, young daughter, and Pruitt ultimately ends up marrying Julian's friend, Madeline Clinkard. A fifth reason you might be interested in all of this is to do, funnily enough, with food, land, and agriculture, because Pruitt was very committed to how people fed themselves, food being one of the reasons that caused the First World War. He ends his relationship with the Garsington Libertine scene by stealing from them when he's running their farm and then commits his whole life to agriculture uh, for the next considerable period. Interestingly, he doesn't see nature as a source of psychic sanctuary in this period, the way Raymond Williams suggested people saw it. Instead, Pruitt still shell-shocked, still what he called living a blue and gold existence. He takes up power farming, uh, uh, working on experimental farms in Oxford, and he brings in the early, he and his colleague are involved with the first combine harvesters being brought into the uh, into Britain. I can't stress how enough how important the combine was. I know it's probably something you don't think about much, but if you think about it, most of mankind have spent an inordinate amount of time doing what it now does for us. That's reaping, threshing and winnowing. And when it came in, it transformed everyone's life and helped that big process of people moving into the cities. And Pruitt devoted his life really to helping mitigate that stress that came from tech, the technology of the war being rolled out onto the land and onto the villages and onto the social glue that held people together. And I think he's absolutely fascinating because of that. He um, marries in 1925, the beautiful Madeline Clinkard. He has a daughter, Jane abandons both of them in 1927, eventually becomes a really successful, the first founding editor of the Farmers Weekly, and ironically makes it a kind of really successful country life uh, of its own, uh, but then leaves it because he doesn't like the message, the reification of the countryside that uh, the Farmers Weekly owners, the direction they want to take it in. As he gets towards the end of his life, I think he comes to find some kind of peace in terms of the trauma from the war. And I'd love Alex now to read The Cloud Snake, which is another walking poem. And this time the poem glimpses, shows the poet glimpsing away through the trauma, uh, a way to avoid the spiritually dangerous east wind that he sees in his walk and conquer the, the dread and the overwhelming fear that's never left him since the war. So I'd love Alex to read this poem, which is one of the more hopeful uh, trauma poems that Pruitt wrote. Over to you, Alex. The Cloud Snake. As I came at dusk to the hump of the wold, I must cross in the sun's afterglow. A black snake of clouds stretched itself on the ridge, and I was afraid to brave it for the valley below. Beyond lay the lighted lowland where I would be, and lighted behind me was the sister vale. Dark only the ridge under the snake of cloud, and cold the subtle east wind at its tail. My shelter lies in the moonlight beyond, I am not daunted by a snake of black, 
So I run onward, so runs the cloud before, trailing the frosted east wind in her track. The blue stars dance before me and behind. Beneath them I know the east wind is not cold. Do not freeze and fear me on this height. I seek only to pass from veil to veil of the wold. Thank you so much. Do not freeze and fear me at this height. You know, he doesn't want to be frozen by frozen in time, which is one of the impacts of profound fear. It disrupts how time is perceived and brings the past suddenly and jar jarringly into the present. So finally, how should we think about Pruitt? What's the bigger picture of how we should understand him? I argue that rather than think in terms of judging him as an imposter, and admittedly, he was a cultural appropriator because you know, there's no, no evidence in his family have gone to some, some effort. His father went to some effort to prove as best he could that there was no uh, DNA proof of indigenous uh, heritage for Pruitt. I think it's better that we try harder, do the more difficult thing, and that is understand what he went through, why his trauma may have resulted in his adopting permanently an indigenous identity. And I argue that his story is an example of something called soft primitivism, a response post-war to the need to recover a sense of authentic self and to resist modernity. It was a personal expression of nostalgia that used an adopted, mythologized indigenous identity, a primitivist myth, as a way of resisting a world that at that time, and maybe we're feeling again now, a time that appeared to lack any recognizable link to the values of the past. Now you can contrast the soft primitivism that Pruitt's doing with stronger versions of primitivism. That's a desire to thrust forward by deliberately forcing going backwards. So that's forcefully recreating or reinstating the past. Now, of course, that's impossible. So it inevitably leads to the imposition of an invented version of the past upon the present. So examples of that might include Nazi Germany, where there was an ideological desire to enforce a Teutonic vision of regeneration through eugenics. And I think you can see strong primitivism at work also in ISIS, where they're trying to impose a version of the seventh century. Of course, primitivism is something that acts within flow and counterflow within modernity. And the drive towards the new is the larger and the stronger force. And if you're thinking, well, I, this doesn't apply to me, I don't do any of that. I think if you look for it, it's everywhere. It's in these things called skewmorphs. So for example, uh, when we're online shopping, we might click on the shopping trolley. Any of you shoppers out there? So you might well use uh, the shopping trolley icon, but there's no real shopping trolley, is there? Just like there's no real bin. This is us harking back to a past that's actually not disappeared, but is, is going because the technological world is supplanting it. And in the same way, we still have the floppy disk when we do saving, we're not actually using a floppy disk. And outside in their cars, there are often spokes we don't really need spokes on cars nowadays. We're always doing this thing, whether we're buying a gingham to hark back to some folkloric uh, image that we might have, or we're always surrounding ourselves with that counterflow to the past in order to make more palatable the process of going forward. So strong primitivism attempts to impose a version of the past that's deemed authentic upon the present. Soft primitivism selects just certain aspects of it to retain in the present. But both forms are doomed really because what's actually at stake are needs and absences felt 
by us, by the modern self. Needs and absences made all the worse by trauma, by war, and by acute technological change. So that's, that's the end of my little presentation. And uh, if you want to know more, there are some other podcasts and other work uh, that other people have done and I have done uh, linked to the Pruitt story and it's on treatedspaces.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy, for that absolutely fascinating talk and those remarkable images too. I think it was very special uh, just to see all that sequence of images that help us visualize things from those that extraordinary little clip, as we discussed before, of the shell-shocked shell -shocked soldiers from the First World War to the paintings that come from his time at Garsington and thinking what um, the rest of Frank Pruitt's remarkable life held. In our remaining time, I'd like just to ask you to expand on a, a few things that you discussed and, and things that I've been curious about in thinking about Frank Pruitt's story. And again, I would absolutely urge our audience members um, to ask their questions, which will be passed to me to relay to Joy. I will say, uh, without introducing myself too much into the discussion, um, but I uh, wrote a book called Chief Engineer, which was about a man called Washington Roebling who um, was the chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge. And he fought for four years, all four years of the American Civil War and really was in the front line of that terrible war and suffered, I believe, psychologically for the rest of his life. Although some of that suffering seems to have been connected both to his childhood and to his work on the bridge. But what interests me about the, the context of what came to be called shell shock in the First World War, as far as my research is concerned, in the 19th century, wasn't really discussed. And now, if we think about the present day, we talk about PTSD, soldiers suffering post-traumatic stress disorder um, from their experiences on the battlefield. And I'm sort of curious what you think about, you know, the development of our language to talk about trauma and perhaps too the, the dangers of thinking about past trauma in our present terms, in the terms we have from the present. I really appreciate and I love that book that you wrote on Roebling, but I really appreciate what you're saying because um, there's a real danger in conflating the non-military sense and understanding of mental health and trauma onto the military world and then doing it again back in time. You're, you're, there's, there's real um, problems of mapping there. Plus, you can't really map shell shock onto PTSD because the formal definition of PTSD is completely diverse from um, shell shock as we would understand it. And then there's the bigger issue that we're talking about the mind, which really we're only taking baby steps. This century, I think, will be um, the century where we learn more about the brain and the mind interface. I know that Barack Obama put a lot of money into uh, brain research, and I think we're going to learn even more. The interesting thing from the historian's point of view is we, they're, they're, and I discuss this at some length in the book, we seem to be coming full circle because during the First World War, the reason they used shell shock was because it was thought that the brain was literally shook uh, by the explosions. Uh, and that, that the, the connections between the parts of the brain were fundamentally affected by that. And now some research is coming back to that idea and, and looking at what happens to the synapses in, in, the, in the brain and, and the, the electrical relationship in, in the brain and what happens whenever you have uh, an explosion near you and the the, the waves that come through the air, what, what does that do 
to to the mind. But I think at a profound level, um, psychological uh, combat trauma is about being overwhelmed by fear. And that's not unique to people who see combat. Arguably, people who get overwhelmed by fear are, are equally or more likely to be the most vulnerable, particularly children and uh, arguably women. So uh, although we tend to talk about shell shock and combat trauma in the male context, I think increasingly we're shifting our gaze to seeing this as, as a phenomena that's very slippery, difficult to discuss in precise terms and that needs a lot of historical specificity because the, the diagnosis changes and the, the terms and the language change over time. I quite like the word shell shock because it is, was popular at the time and it hasn't gone away. And I always think when a meme survives, a term survives over time, there's, it, it's speaking to something within culture and we shouldn't really dismiss it for that reason. Uh, fascinating, fascinating answer. I would love to, to speak more with you about this. Um, I'd also like to um, maybe ask you to expand a little bit on this moment of, of Pruitt's or, or period of time when he was in the hospital and when he landed on this Iroquois identity, um, which as you said in your talk, obviously he felt some connection um, to native people from his childhood, but how did it really come about um, that, he, that he took up this specific identity in this period? Well, I have some ideas, but no direct evidence why he would take this on. I think it's probably connected to Tom Longboat, who was really famous at the time. Um, speed running long distance was very fashionable in the Canada that he grew up in. And you know, tens of thousands would line the streets to watch guys like Tom Longboat. Uh, and it was thought that there was, a, a, and there was real evidence that there was a, uh, an Indian looping style and he and Tom Longboat went on to sell shoes in Canada very successfully uh, in, in a marketing sense uh, because the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee were connected uh, for historically good reasons uh, with long distance running because that was how uh, diplomacy was conducted through long distance running. So uh, Pruitt would have grown up seeing this young man as a someone to aspire to and look up to. Uh, also, he grew up a settler, and you you cannot really um, grow up on settle as a settler without being aware of of previous cultures. For example, uh, there's a famous poet called. Uh, Pauline Johnson that he may have been exposed to, um, who was also Haudenosaunee. And um, that she may have um, encouraged him to think about himself in poetic terms and to think in a poetic way. She's another fascinating character who would um, do a kind of burlesque show uh, as both a traditional Mohawk woman and also as a civilized uh, woman, as an amazing character from history. So I think probably uh, he was rejecting his fire and brimstone Protestant grandfather who taught him that he was born in sin and looking for another better culture to adopt. And the experience of shell shock made him complete shift into a another adopted identity. So he's going beyond playing Indian. He's fully adopting and going across that border into another self. Um, and we have a, a question from the audience, which I, I think is, is, is brief, um, but just to, to clarify um, that there really was no, um, as far as we, you know, DNA actual connection um, no. to any indigenous culture. Well, I did quite a bit of work on this and um, 
his father, Bill Pruitt, very kindly gave me a DNA record that proved that Pruitt had no actual um, heritage. But then I sought advice from folk who work in this field. And in order to really prove this, and so on, you would have had to do much more detail personally and politically and being Irish myself, I'm not really in the business of telling people who they are. Uh, and I realize that this, this has a different context um, you know, now when we're so concerned about cultural appropriation. But then also I respect the fact that the Pruitt family have always been um, very keen to show that there is actually no, no heritage that is indigenous in the Pruitt family. Uh, but I think that um, our obsession with this is in itself, our obsession with borders and, and, and definitiveness about identity uh, is problematic and difficult. And, and as an intellectual, the more you look into it, um, the more the more complex you get it would be my answer. That's not a definitive answer in any in in any real way, but I think that Pruitt's complex and he raises complexity the more you seriously study it. And I don't work on DNA, but the people I talked to who did left me more confused than when I started. <laughs> if that helps. That's um yes from again from my small um, reading, um, but I think that sometimes we've been led to understand um, certainly that some of the commercially available kind of DNA tests are less accurate than perhaps we would have been led to believe. I I don't want to um, you know sort of pu push you beyond your period or the specifics of our discussion. Um, but this obviously is still very much a live issue. And I was just listening to a New York Times, excuse me, podcast <clears throat> that was just about this, about a, a scholar um, uh, seeming to claim native heritage, Native American heritage. Um, and indeed in your talk, you mentioned Johnny Depp who has been, he has claimed uh, to have, I think, Creek or Cherokee heritage. And I know that there are people who dispute this. This, this desire, both in, in, a, in North America, in Canada and the United States, um, to specifically claim native heritage seems a, a really fascinating phenomenon. Um, and you, you talked, of course, at the end of your discussion about soft primitivism and the, the, the different varieties of this desire, but, but why do you think it's so enduring? Uh, I'll just say that Johnny Depp's, uh, as far as I know, Comanche. Um, yeah, Comanche, yes, you're yeah. quite right. Sorry. And because I, I was out in the house of uh, Donna, of my, her last name escapes me, American Indian Organization. Yes, who, had, who sort of adopted him in a sense. Yeah, and that made all the papers. And, and at the time he was promoting a pretty bogus movie, um, the Tonto movie. Indeed. Uh, that's why I think the young Johnny Depp, if I could go back in time, would be just the guy to play uh, Pruitt. And anyway, Donna and I had a, a long uh, laugh about the whole phenomena of 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 him, um, I think it's worth remembering just how fabulously rich Johnny Depp is and how um, how powerful he was at the time that he, you know, got adopted. I mean, that's, that's not an insignificant um, fact. I forget now what the question was, what, what was the question? Well, it was really why, why, um, why this specific, it's not just Johnny Depp, but why this specific phenomenon of wishing to claim native heritage in North America. It's something we see frequently. We've seen it in, I've seen it with authors in Canada, authors in the United States. Um, a, a, a desire to, this continued desire, not just in the period you're writing about, mm. to attach oneself to native, specifically to native heritage. 
Yeah, and of course, uh, Bill Clinton, I understand, had a Cherokee grandmother. It's always the grandmothers and it's always the Cherokee. It's never some tribe you've never heard of, like, I don't know, the Cayuga or something. People tend to have Cherokee grandmothers. Uh, that seems to be the thing. Um, it, it, this is something that elites are particularly, I think, prone to. Uh, and it's to do with a, a form of um, wanting to go back, soft, soft primitivism, being being um, wanting to reject modernity and find an authentic self. And um, anthropologists are doing it at, uh, in, during, the, during and before the First World War. They're going out trying to salvage the authentic and salvage functioning communities because they, they see it as something in the past that's slipping away and needs to be put in a museum and, and somehow reified and fetishized and put on a wall. So it's to do with making the primitive, and the Irish were in this bracket for a while, uh, not coeval with modernity. So the authentic is always in the past and, and, uh, and, and, and it exists in that beautiful space that's invented and therefore perfect. And the mess of the complex, tricky present is always somehow authentic and lacking. And, and so this, this is the urge to go back to the past and find this primitive dream. And of course, indigenous people have always been bound up with guilt. You know, if you look at our horror movies, there's often horror happening at the old Indian burial ground. And you can see that that's a historic hist history that's been buried that's coming up to, to affect the settlers once again. You know, there's this, there's this desire both to have the primitive in the past, but also to extract the best bits and link them to elites in the present. It's a, it's a psychological game that you can see happening over time. Phil Deloria um, at Harvard's written a wonderful book about this years ago called Playing Indian, which was a phrase from a guy that I did a biography of called Arthur Parker. And he said, to be an Indian, you have to play Indian. And he was talking about how identity is something that's inherently performative. And uh, because identity is performed, it can be stolen, adopted, appropriated, and uh, melded into particular uses. So I think that's what's going on very much. You, you talk about um, borders between identities. That's a, a term that you used. And of course, um, another way in which Pruitt crossed over borders was in his sexuality. Oh, yeah. And you say in your talk in a very kind of uncomplicated way, you know, he had a love affair um, with um, Siegfried Sassoon. And then, of course, that remarkable photograph of him with um, Stephen Tennant. But then, of course, he went on. He married a woman. He had a daughter. Um, can you say a little more about what you know about his relationship to his sexuality, as, as yeah. he probably, again, sexuality, it seems to me being a kind of 21st century term. The person having the most interesting sex life probably at this time is Lytton Strachey, uh, really transgressive. But this is a very permissive place, Garsington. And it's, it's, it's people who are living life in a they're living life in a performative way. I mean, Otline actually built a theater porch at Garsington where people could act and, and, and express themselves in ways that they couldn't elsewhere. Now, Sassoon is, I'll just show that picture again, if we can get to it. Sassoon is much more at ease than Pruitt at this time with the sexuality. These are actually pictures from from quite you know the thirties, uh, but around nineteen eighteen, Sassoon is going up to the farm of Edward Carpenter, who wrote one of the earliest books um, 
talking in a positive sense about homosexuality and linking it interestingly to the great warrior traditions across time. And um, Susun is much more comfortable and more active in terms of his homosexuality than Pruitt. Pruitt, I don't really think can satisfy anyone because he's so profoundly traumatized. You know, he's not always in control of, of himself um, because of the, the shell shock. And Sassoon pursues him at some length and takes him to Rome and lusts over him, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, um, Pruitt is incapable of satisfying Ottoline Morel, and that does not end well for him. Uh, because, of course, he's very poor when he's staying in Garsington. He steals Sassoon's trousers at one point. And really, in doing that, he's making a class statement. He gets thrown out of this gilded, rich world, the equivalent of trust fund babes, as it were. You know, the, the equivalent of this Garsington set would be Silicon Valley today. He gets thrown out of this gilded universe uh, when he very ostentatiously and flamboyantly steals money, large amounts of it, from Ottoline's husband, Philip. So he's trading on his sexuality. He's also messing with class boundaries. Maybe those are the biggest boundaries he's messing with. And also he's, um, he's in a world of flowering in terms of homosexual expression and Garsington is, is is really one of the most important I think gay places in Britain uh, and more than just gay it's uh, a place of sexual freedom uh, on every and sexual perhaps mm -hmm. um, we have I think time for one final question um, which I will take from uh, Jonathan Vance who is at the University of Western Ontario and he says uh, I'm fascinated by Pruitt's interest in agriculture in that period in Canada, people who were obsessed by agriculture in that way were often anti-modernists and the combine harvester was an element of modernism. Instead, they idealized the old steam threshers operated by gangs of men who went from farm to farm. How does Pruitt deal with a technology that many similar thinkers were suspicious of because of its very modernity? I am honored that Jonathan Vance would be tuning in. Wow, so this is the author of May, uh, really important uh, work in this field. Thank you very much. Um, Pruitt is actually paid by Oxford University to go over to Canada to look at all of this change happening because Canada in 1937 brings in the first um, combine and these changes are happening in Canada first and Britain wants to, wants to learn, which is quite interesting. Uh, Pruitt is you won't be surprised to hear uh, double uh, uh, ambivalent. He both writes a novel, The Chazzy Tragedy, which is all about what's lost whenever people lose this fundamental connection to the land. But then in his working life, he's also working to bring in what he calls power farming, which is using all the tricks that we're now, be get, we're, we're now becoming more comfortable with. So there's a guy in Italy called Strampanelli who's developing new forms of wheat that are more resistant uh, to disease. And of course, uh, by the time you get to the 1960s, this leads to the Green Revolution. And at the same time, you've this new mechanism and the, the, also the Haber process goes hand in hand with the First World War, those bombs that, you know, and the, 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 the use of nitrogen fixing fertilizer, that history goes in tandem. So the world's gonna be able to feed a much larger number of people and prove it's right there at the heart of it all. And he's both scared of it and he's also forced really to be part of it because he he knows how to farm he's got all the right connections at oxford and he can see the writing on the wall and i i find this absolutely fascinating because it's then also in his poetry you know he writes beautifully about the lip lopping hair and he writes really sexy poems about having sex outdoors you know i shall take you in the lee of trees and etc so he's got a very positive attitude to nature 
but also because he's been blown up and buried alive, he sees the essential irrelevance of mankind to the great churning reality of life on earth, the hydrological system, the, the stars, the, the, how um, death and decay and rebirth happen. He, he gains a new consciousness from having been dead, as it were, and buried alive, and then clawing his way out. So he's an ambivalent figure, and, and for that, it's just another reason I find him fascinating. Well, this talk has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, and thank you, Alex, for your wonderful reading of the poems. And thanks to the British Library and the Echo Center. And before we close, I will commend to all of our wonderful audience. And of course, thank you for coming. Um, I will commend Joy's book to you, Trauma, Primitivism and the First World War, The Making of Frank Toronto Pruitt. We've just had the most remarkable taste of this fascinating life. So again, thank you so much, Joy. Um, it's been wonderful to talk to you. And thank you to the Pruitt family without whom this book wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. <laughs>